right conditions, diverse groups outperform experts who are like-minded in domains such as problem solving and prediction. Diverse groups also score higher on survey instruments that evaluate perspectives and heuristics that are related to the problem. And lastly, the data show that diverse groups perform better when faced with challenges to preferences, behavior, and communication. So these are the 10 most recent ACSM past presidents. And this slide might be my favorite of this presentation because these are my friends. They're my friends for life. And this was true for some before I or even they became president. So for example, Carol Garber was my thesis advisor and talked me down from the ledge after I left her many, many times during my PhD program. And speaking of my PhD program, Larry Armstrong was my dissertation advisor. And many, many times I wanted to push him off of a ledge, but he was a really tough professor and now he's one of my dearest friends. Barb Ainsworth spent time with my middle daughter and I as she was looking for her academic institution for undergrad. And we toured the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. And Liz Joy and Bill Dexter and I went hiking one day in Maine. And at the end of the hike, there were tree worms that we had to pick out of each other's hair, which sounds really gross, but it was hilarious. And I can go on and on about these people and my love for them. And that's not, however, the point of my slide. Well, all of these people were huge advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's something about them that they can't change. Um, something about them that we can't change, that nobody can change, and that's that they're all white. They're nobody who's, there's nobody who's Asian um, or Hispanic or um, Alaskan Pacific Islander or anything else that isn't white. And if I included the 53 people who were ACSM presidents before them, they'd all be white too. In fact, we got our first minority American president before we got our first minority American College of Sports Medicine president. These past presidents were really representative of ACSM's history, but today ACSM is intentionally and actively attempting to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion in many, many ways. And this unfortunately has made some very well-meaning people very uncomfortable for a variety of reasons. Some may think that maybe they'll say something that will offend someone or be politically incorrect. Others might feel being more inclusive means that there's less to give, that they're gonna to have to give something up and that there'll be less for them. I'm fairly certain there's nobody like that here. However, um, when we're trying to convince homogeneous groups to diversify, it may be a good idea to focus on fairness. Most people are interested in equality and fairness. Fairness to members and constituents and the communities that are being served. Equality is about sameness. It promotes fairness and justice by giving everyone the same thing. That can only work if everyone starts from the same place. Equity is about fairness, but it's about making sure people get access to the same opportunities and sometimes our differences in race or disability or geographic location or religion or sexual orientation or sexual identity or veteran status um, or gender or physical capabilities or some other variants can cre create barriers to access and participation. So we must first ensure equity before we can enjoy equality. I wanted to share with you ACSM's diversity statement that says ACSM is committed to diversity. ACSM values and seeks diverse and inclusive participation within the fields of exercise science and sports medicine. It promotes expanded diversity in membership, involvement, and access to leadership. Diversity within ACSM creates a working and learning atmosphere that encourages varied perspectives and an open exchange of ideas. ACSM will review programming annually to best determine how to maintain diversity initiatives. And this statement was written in 2005 um, by the ACSM Task Force on Diversity Action, which I led at the time. These are all of ACSM's diversity initiatives. Um, the first one is the FASA Mark Dream Program. 
and it provided funding to any student who could demonstrate a financial need, so basically all students, up to $2,000 in funding to attend ACSM's annual meeting and or a regional chapter meeting hosted by ACSM. Unfortunately, this federally funded program was discontinued by our current administration in July of this year. The second program that I have listed is a leadership and diversity training program. And then the third is the mentoring women to fellowship program. And both are ACSM internally managed programs that provide members with the necessary information and access to achieve fellowship. Um, in a few minutes, I will explain why achieving ACSM fellowship is important for those who want to influence ACSM de decisions. The first group that I have listed is the Strategic Health Initiative for Women, Sport, and Physical Activity. And that group focuses on health promotion for girls and women. This is the group that also organizes the annual women's breakfast at the ACSM annual meeting. They also direct the application selection and management of the mentoring women to fellowship program participants. The next group is the Minority Health and Research Special Interest Group, and it's ACSM's oldest entity that focuses on diversity, equity, and in inclusion. When I first attended that special interest group meeting in 1994, there were about 10 people. And today this group has over, 100, over 200 people um, who are members. The Diversity Action Committee uh, was formed from the Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity Action that I mentioned on the previous slide. And this is now a permanent committee that was established under the leadership of past president, Dr. Larry Armstrong. And, and he and others be believed that diversity, equity, and inclusion within ACSM would always need attention. The Diversity Action Committee is attentive to um, DEI within ACSM programming and membership. The committee also directs the application selection and management of the leadership and diversity training program participants. The next group is the Exercises Medicine for underserved and community health that focuses on ensuring that individuals from low income and or rural settings receive the same opportunities to receive exercise referral from healthcare providers to community resources and fitness professionals if needed. And later I'm going to spend a significant portion of my presentation on the work of this strategic health initiative. In 2017 ACSM Administrative Council added three diversity and an three diversity, equity, and inclusion trustee positions. And these individuals are elected to the board of trustees to ensure that every discussion and decision that the board makes considers diversity, equity, and inclusion. And lastly, the diversity action network is made up of the over 200 former leadership and diversity training program participants. These individuals support communication, professional development and scholarship among one another, as well as any other student or junior faculty member who has interest in advancing diversity within the college. Um, last year, after the passing of Dr. Barbara Drinkwater, the Strategic Health Initiative for Women's Sport and Physical Activity recommended to the Board of Trustees and the Board of Trustees passed the renaming of the Rathbone Breakfast to the Rathbone Drinkwater Memorial Breakfast. This is a fitting tribute to ACSM's only founder, Dr. Josephine Rathbone, who was a woman, and ACSM's first woman president, Dr. Barbara Drinkwater. This is a picture of Dr. Drinkwater and ACSM's current historian, Dr. Sean Walsh. And each year at the annual meeting, there's a diversity um, well, there's the Diversity Action Committee hosts a reception that's called ACSM Celebrates Diversity, as well as a, a joint symposium that invites someone external to the college to join ACSM members to deliver a diversity, equity, and inclusion related topic. So I told you that I was going to give you um, just a general overview, and this slide contains the, that overview of ACSM's leadership structure. So first, in the first box to the far left, um, there are over 119 existing volunteer opportunities in the form of committees, task forces, strategic health initiatives, and special interest groups. In addition to these standing opportunities, other ways to serve include submitting sessions, such as a symposia or tutorial, or being a moderator for a free communication slide or thematic poster session at the annual meeting. As you increase your service to ACSM, you may have some interest in serving on one of um, the ACSM Board of Trustee positions. 
There are six professional trustee categories, including medicine, education and allied health, basic and applied science, diversity, equity and inclusion. And at all times, um, there are six trustees representing most of the groups. The diversity, equity, inclusion has three trustees, trustees representing that group. There are also two international trustees and one regional chapter trustee. And these are elected positions and only ACSM fellows are eligible to run for these positions. There's also a student trustee who is elected from a pool of regional chapter student representatives. And speaking of those regional chapters, there's, these also count as service to the organization and can be used towards fellowship. As you can see from the slide, there are also two vice presidents of membership communication, education, and policy, and two vice presidents of medicine, science, health, and fitness. And once you run for a trustee position, you're eligible to run for a vice president position. And once you run for a vice president, you're eligible to run for president elect. And the president elect, president, and past president make up the executive committee. Any proposal for change within ACSM um, typically goes typically comes to the board of trustees in one of two ways, either through a topical committee, so one of those 119 opportunities, or through the executive committee. And if you have any interest in being part of the ACSM decision-making process, become a fellow. Becoming a fellow is a necessary way to increase your ability to participate. So why do I mention this? I wanted to show you this slide where on the top dotted line, that is the number of male fellows between 2009 and 2019. That bottom line represents the number of female fellows between 2009 and 2019. Um, and there's been a steady increase in female fellows, slow but steady from 2009 to 2019. And the number of male fellows has probably been about the same during that same time period, except for the dip in 2016. So you look at that and some of you might be thinking, well, of course that makes sense because the number of female fellows and the number, or excuse me, the number of female members is below the number of male members. So of course there would be this disparity. But in fact, uh, between 20, 2008 and 2019, the number of male and female members is about the same. And so that's why um, we implemented the Mentoring Women to Fellowship program in order to address that disparity. When we talk about the number of members by race, um, it's a little bit more difficult and I'll explain in a minute why, but that pink space represents the number of, of white, per, uh, white members. Um, the green box or the green space represents Asian members, uh, the blue Hispanic and Latino members, and then the red African-American members. And why it's really difficult is many members don't report their race and many international members don't feel like their race is represented in these categories and so they don't report either. And um, so it's really hard for us to know the percentage of members who are of a certain race and who are also fellows. We're trying to track it, but it's just a little bit more difficult. But what we do know is there's a need for mentorship around this area to get people more involved. Uh, so research shows that students who have mentors tend to be more engaged in professional development activities. They're better paired, prepared for academic rigor that's presented by the major. They have a larger network to a larger access um, to access both students and um, professional networks. They feel more supported and they have more confidence. Remember in the beginning of the presentation, I said that everyone needs at least one mentor. Well, this is even true for us because professionals who have mentors have higher incomes, they're more frequently promoted, they experience more greater job satisfaction, they tend to hold more leadership positions, and they're more likely to become mentors themselves. And in that instance, professionals who mentor take pride in the advancement of a protege, they have enriched networks, they stay more current on scientific and secular trends, they attract strong colleagues and strong students to their academic institution, and they're personally more satisfied um, with, their, with their job satisfaction. So we've been running this leadership and diversity training program for about 13 years. And a lot of organizations reach out to us and say, how does it work? What is it that you're doing? Can you share more information? 
we've got these not only from professional organizations, but also from NIH. They want to know what is it that ACSM is doing to increase um, their number, their, their diversity. Because when you go to an annual me meeting, everybody can see it looks really different in 2019 than it looked in 1994. So um, Dr. Eddie Bustamante, who is the former um, director of the Leadership and Diversity Training Program, Chris Sawyer, who um, is the Director of Marketing and Membership for ACSM, um, Michael Brown, who's the current chair of the Diversity Action Committee, and Oscar Suman, who's a longtime member of the Diversity Action Committee, and myself, um, published this paper called the American College of Sports Medicine Leadership and Diversity Training Program, Harnessing Mentorship to Diversify Organizational Leadership. I'm not going to go through the paper today because there's not time, um, but I would, if you're interested, really encourage you uh, to look up this paper and give it a read. So I had previously said that I'm going to talk more deeply about the Strategic Health Initiative for Health Equity, and um, I'll, the bulk of the rest of my presentation is going to involve the work of this group. Um, it was established in 2012 as part of the, uh, part of the presidential platform of Dr. Barbara Ainsworth. And her platform was entitled Healthy, Active, and Inclusive. Dr. Rebecca Hassan um, is the founding chair of the Strategic Health Initiative and remains active and engaged as she promotes this work. Three years ago, Gretchen Patch, ACSM's Director of Strategic Health Programs, brought her public health expertise to this group to support us and is now the staff liaison um, between the Strategic Health Initiative and the Board of Trustees. So why did we want to address health equity um, through physical activity? So to explain why we look to physical activity to move to the achievement of health equity, I turn to one of my favorite quotes from William Roberts, who writes, physical activity has lipid lowering, antihypertensive, positive inotropic, negative conotropic, vasodilating, diuretic, anorexigenic, weight reducing, cathartic, hypoglycemic, tranquilizing, hypnotic, and antidepressive qualities. It also prevents osteoporosis and certain types of cancer. ACSM members understand the benefits of physical activity and the notion that everyone should have the same opportunity to do it is something that most members can support. Focusing on physical activity to achieve health equity makes sense for ACSM. In the next several slides, I'll give a general overview of the physical activity disparities. Not only is physical activity necessary for health, but it also can be of no cost to anyone. There's no need to invest in equipment or purchase an app or buy an e-membership. Physical activity is available to everyone regardless of age, race, socioeconomic status, gender identity, um, country of origin, veteran status or ability. It is a true health equalizer and physical activity is the low hanging fruit to achieve health equity. So in terms of physical activity disparities, first I present, I present the percentage of adults who are non-Hispanic white and report being physically inactive. The color key on the right indicates the lowest to highest reporting states with the lowest being green, moving to yellow, then to orange with red being the highest. So the lowest reporters or the most active people live in Colorado and Hawaii, and the highest reporters or the least active people live in Colorado. I mean, live in Puerto Rico, sorry. Next, I present uh, the percentage of adults who are Hispanic and report being physically inactive. Look at the color change. Only four states are green, seven states and territories are yellow, and the rest are orange or red. Vermont has the lowest or most active reporters and Puerto Rico again has the highest or least active reporters. So based on these maps, there's a lot of opportunities for both white and Hispanic Americans who are living in Puerto Rico. This slide shows the percentage of adults who are non-Hispanic black and report being physically inactive. The states and territories without color indicate that there was insufficient numbers of black people responding to draw a conclusion. Of the states and territories reporting, only one state is green. Five states were yellow, and all of the remaining states were orange or red. 
Reporters from Oregon were most physically active and those from Wisconsin were the least physically active. And while I recognize that the world is made up of more than the US and the US is made up of more than just black, Hispanic and white people, I'm pulling these data from what's provided from the Centers for Disease Control and Pre um, Prevention, which is a highly respected, reputable site. Here I present data from the CDC on adults who are 50 years old and older. On the previous slides, I presented that whites were more active than Hispanics who were more active than Blacks. This slide also demonstrates that people from other races report being more active than Blacks and Hispanics, but less active than whites. And if you wanna know what other races, you can look at the bottom of the slide, they're listed. But there is a true racial disparity in physical activity. You may have noticed from the maps that there's a regional disparity from physical activity with the Southern region of the US being the least active and the Western region of the US being the most active. It's unknown if these disparities are related to demographic differences of the region's residents or differences in climate, the built environment, the natural environment, a combination, something else, um, but targets that are ripe for research and possible intervention for sure. And it's also well known that males are more physically active than females and younger adults are more physically active than older adults and that physical activity increases with education. Oops. 11.6% of adults in the United States or about 21.5 million people report having a disability people with disabilities are more likely to have at least one chronic disease. And 40.5% of adults with a disability compared to 13% of adults who don't have a disability have a chronic disease. 47% of adults with a disability report being physically inactive and 54% report getting no aerobic physical activity. The figure on the left shows physical activity levels among people with disabilities who have the least, at least one chronic disease is lower than those who have no chronic diseases. And the figure on the right compares physical activity levels among those who have a disability and had physical activity recommendations made to them by their healthcare provider and those who did not. Clearly there's an intervention opportunity among people with disabilities and their healthcare providers. So on a previous slide, I showed that older adult men are more physically active when compared to women. The same holds true for younger men and women and, and the same for boys and girls. Um, there's an emerging body of research that investigates physical activity disparities among sexual minorities. Much of this research is tied to adolescent and young adults and sport. Much more work is needed to build the evidence around diverse populations of sexual minorities. However, there's research that shows that lesbians do not engage in sufficient amounts of physical activity and boys and girls who identify as homosexuals engage in less weekly, weekly moderate to vigorous physical activity. There are no differences in physical activity participation when homosexual and heterosexual men are compared. Time doesn't permit me to describe all of the health disparities that exist that could be addressed through physical activity. And at this point, I'm going to move to strategies that ACSM is implementing to achieve health equity. I direct you to the 2017 publication written by several members of the Strategic Health Initiative for Health Equity entitled, Achieving Equity in Physical Activity Participation, ACSM Experience and Next Steps. While ACSM continues to follow the same strategies that were recommended in this paper, for the rest of the presentation, I'll demonstrate our progress to date. ACSM has a unified strategy to address diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it includes the Minority Health and Research Special Interest Group. This is ACSM's largest and longest standing group that convenes around health equity. This, the Strategic Health Initiative for Health Equity that can be described as ACSM's, ACSM's diversity, equity, and inclusion public health arm is largely leading this work. The Diversity Action Committee um, with an over 10 year history of monitoring diversity, equity and inclusion within the college and EIM for underserved populations and community health, which has been expanded since our 2017 publication to not only address EIM related concerns at a population health level, but also at a community health level. 
I referenced this paper on the last slide and on the previous slide, um, I mean, a couple of slides ago and on the previous slide, but I wanted you to be able to easily find it. So I'm including the full reference here, and I encourage you to read it to learn about ACSM's first five years of progress toward health equity. Um, the remainder of this presentation contains updated examples of the processes that ACSM follows to achieve health, health equity through physical activity. So our 2017 recommendation was to engage commu community through evaluation, communication, education, and collaboration. To date, we've had many successes in communication, education, and collaboration. We have begun the process of evaluation, but recognize that this will take more time and are leveraging our partners who I'll present shortly, as well as ACSM strategic programs to achieve evaluation goals. The ACSM website was updated three years ago and part of that update included showcasing ACSM's diversity initiatives, awards, and programs. ACSM will continue to use the website as a communication strategy to engage members as well as external audiences with the most up-to-date information to address issues that are related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. This talks about the leadership and diversity training program. Um, we also have um, websites that contain um, translated documents from English to Spanish and other languages from our international members around the nation. ACSM is also leveraging the Exercise is Medicine website as well as the American Fitness Index website as other communication strategies to raise awareness of the health inequities and convey, convey the power of physical activity to positively impact the health of underserved populations. I also want to show you th that ACSM volunteers have um, been busy working on these materials um, and realizing diversity, equity, and inclusion. The final communication st strategy that I'll present is raising awareness through social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. ACSM uses its own social media accounts and increases the impressions by encouraging its followers to serve as ambassadors and change agents. These are either newer or more robust processes when compared to 2017. Also new is the sports medicine checkup that ACSM pod, it's an ACSM podcast for physicians and is hosted by doctors Tina Master and Alex McDonald. So this is a Facebook post um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion from ACSM. Um, this is an Instagram post um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, this is um, one of the many Twitter posts. This is um, when I was a guest on the podcast. The second strategy is education. And since 2017, several continuing education credits have been made available to receive training and information about physical activity for special populations, such as people with disabilities or people who have comorbidities that most often affect Blacks, Hispanics, and older adults. We've also done a lot of communication around maintaining physical activity during um, COVID-19 for both older adults and youth. Experts from ACSM have delivered webinars that specifically address achieving health equity through physical activity. Many of these webinars remain on the ACSM learning management system, and I encourage you to take advantage of them. As you can see on this slide, the group exercise instructor webinar five, um, five entitled Exercise Safety in Managing Diverse Populations is available for viewing um, and it started in July, 2020. Finally, ACSM offers education in the more traditional form of publications that are focused on diversity, equity and inclusion in all of the ACSM journals. Publications focused on these topics have increased since 2017 as first, there's a greater number of scientists and investigators looking at these topics. And second, we have raised the awareness of ACSM's role of diversity, equity, and inclusion among journal editors and reviewers. 
The third pathway is collaboration, and ACSM has numerous partners that join us with the goal of achieving health equity through physical activity. I only have time to highlight a few, but the National Youth Sports Health and Safety Institute is ACSM's youth sport and physical activity arm. This is a partnership with Sanford Health that looks to promote equity and physical activity participation, regardless of income or ability. For the last four years, ACSM has partnered with Aspen Institute's Project Play to participate in frequent written and live communications among partners to develop data-driven tools and resources for the promotion of health and safety of physical activity in sport among youth and their parents and coaches. You, have, you may have seen some of the compelling videos um, entitled Don't Retire Kid. Um, that resulted in some of the work from Project Play. I'm gonna play one of those videos now, or I'm gonna attempt to, um, and then talk about it on the other side. Jay, can you give me the thumbs up if you can hear it? I'm here to announce my retirement from sports. The pressure to take to play at nine is not what I expected when I started at five. I'm done with parents picking apart my every move with the coaches that think I'm not strong enough. I'll miss my teammates, but I obviously can't compete at this level. Any questions? So there are several videos like this, and ACSM is partnering with the Aspen Institute to raise awareness for the importance of youth sport in helping all kids regardless of gender, regardless of income, regardless of ability, remain healthy and active by keeping the focus of youth sport on friends, fun, and fitness. The third and final partnership I'll present to you is the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance, convened by ACSM past president Russ Pate. The National Physical Activity Plan Alliance is formed by a coalition of organizations that work to promote physical activity in the United States through, through evidence-based strategies. The National Physical Activity Plan, which is a comprehensive set of policies, programs, and initiatives resulted from the National Physical Activity Alliance, I'm sorry, from the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance. Three of the four Alliance officers, including Bill Cole, Liz Joy, and me are ACSM fellows, and two of us are presidents or past presidents. This group has merged with the National Coalition for the Promotion of Physical Activity and the National Physical Activity Society to create a newly formed, unified, and stronger coalition that's now called the Physical Activity Alliance. Evaluation is the fourth and final pathway to assure that ACSM attains measurable progress in reducing physical activity disparities to promote health equity. Over the last several slides, I've described numerous outcomes that we've accomplished toward health equity. Um, some have come specifically from the members of the Strategic Health Initiative from Health Equity or are promoted by the measurable achievements of Active Earth and Exercise as Medicine. The American Fitness Index monitors health-related outcomes, including physical activity, participation, and major metropolitan areas across the US. Three years ago, it expanded from 50 to 100 cities in order to be more inclusive. I'll close with this quote from our 2017 paper that says, ACSM recognizes that investing in physical activity is valuable in terms of both quality of life and longevity. Our goal is to promote a, system, a systemic increase in population physical activity participation along with increased access to supportive environments and opportunities that promote an active lifestyle, which will likely aid in efforts of achieving health equity in the United States. I invite you to join one of the many activities that I've described during this presentation, or use the strategies that I've described to achieve health equity through physical activity within organizations that are external to ACSM. You're also welcome to contact me with any questions or comments that you may have. And I wanna thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Nicole. Really um, appreciated your, your talk. Um, 
if people have questions, you can um, please put those into the, the chat and I will be um, monitoring that and then um, uh, moderating the, the questions to uh, Nicole. So um, you really hit on um, a lot of efforts from um, you know, this organization of professionals um, in sports medicine and exercise science um, to address physical activity um, disparities. What are some things that you've seen effective in, in your own community in Indianapolis? Do you have some examples of maybe some uh, community-based or school-based programs or anything like that? Yeah, so I think that the biggest, um the biggest act action that um, a, that the um, that in, that has been made in Indianapolis is a change to the built environment, and so the sidewalks have become more walkable, the um, streets have become more bikeable. We've seen an increase in bike lanes. There's also been an increase in trails that are paved um, throughout communities, so people can um, actively transport from one community to the next. We have two trails that go through um, two three counties. Um, the Monon Trail and the Cultural Trail, where people who live in those counties can actually get on their bike or jog or run um, to destinations, which is a big deal. And so I think that increasing, improving the built environment so that people can be active in their transportation and activities of daily living is really important. Um, you also asked about schools. And um, what I will say is that we have a program that you referenced in your introduction um, called Physically Active Residential Communities and Schools, where our exercise science majors go to public schools in Indianapolis, and the principals of those public schools have opened their doors to community members who can come in and work out with our exercise science majors as um, group fitness instructors or personal trainers, where they can get some experiential learning um, and the community can get access to um, low or no cost exercise opportunities. So it's a pro program um, at last I saw there were 4,000, we affected 4,000 individual members of the community. Um, we are not measuring community health outcomes. It would be really hard to do because it's a fairly transient community, uh, but we know that people are joining and they're coming back. Great, great, fantastic. So here's a um, question specific to the, the university environment. Um, what can we be doing at the level of an undergraduate student to promote health equity within our own undergraduate community? Sure, so I would reference you to um, the EIM on campus. Do you, um, are you involved with EIM on campus? Don't know? I, I believe that- I'm getting, um, I'm getting a nod. I believe okay. that David <laughs> Edwards is uh, okay. one of our faculty members. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So that's the way to do it. Um, th because EIM on campus offers so many campus resources um, for physical activity opportunities. But my recommendation is to make sure that these opportunities are available to students who are playing a sport um, or who have to work. And it might sound really strange to you, like, why do athletes need to be involved in exercises, medicine, and physical activity participation? Well, for the majority of the athletes, when they finish competing at the collegiate level, they're not gonna go pro. And those athletes who are D1 athletes at your institution um, have been told for many, many years, potentially most of their life, according to the um, Don't Ret Retire Kid video, that they've been told what to do in terms of physical activity. And for them to learn um, how to be physically active in an independent and enjoyable way without the coach or their teammate supporting them is really important. And so it is very important to get the athletes involved in the activities of EIM on campus. Also thinking about students who work and might not have the free time. What can you do for them that they can do on their own time and not have to join a group activity, but could still be supported and motivated to be physically active while they're students on campus? So I just encourage you, I love this question it's a wonderful question, but to think about those people who would typically be excluded from campus activities, how can you get them involved in EIM on campus to make sure they're getting the physical activity that they need to remain healthy? It could be something as simple as um, reminder signage um, that reminds them to 
if they take this path rather than that path, they're gonna get this many extra steps and over a course of the day, they're gonna walk this many miles. So it could be signs. Um, it could be reminders that you put in an app and um, ha have people interact with the app on their own time. But just think about ways that you can access people who would normally not be able to participate. Great, thank you so much. Um, th this is a, a question that's that's more on the ACSM uh, priority side. So does the ACSM foundation have a separate set of guidelines and practices related to DEI, or does it fall under the general guidelines and programs that you've described? So the ACSM foundation is, is a separate entity, um, not controlled by ACSM. However, all of the officers from ACSM sit on the foundation board um, and there is cross communication. The challenge with the ACSM foundation is that most gifts um, are not general gifts. They're uh, dedicated to a certain group. So when I give to the ACSM foundation, my gift goes to diversity, equity, inclusion programs. Um, there are other people who have like given endowed. So Dr. Drinkwater as part of her estate left an endowment to the Strategic Health Initiative for Women's Sport and Physical Activity. So most of the foundation dollars are already designated to be used for a specific purpose. Are we looking at, as we offer awards, how many people um, from underrepresented groups are receiving awards? How many international students are receiving awards? We are absolutely paying attention to that, um, but within the context of the designated gift. Great. I hope I answered the question. Great, thank you. And, and kind of related to that is, what is ACSM doing in terms of investing in funding scholarships specifically related to DEI? So there has been a minority scholarship uh, fund since I joined the organization in 1992. Um, that fund has increased over the years, but most of the people who give, give to the leadership and diversity training program and not just a general scholarship. Um, there are still people who contribute to the minority scholarship, but they are seeing how the leadership and diversity training program is developing people to not only stay within ACSM, but to go outside in their academic or clinical or professional organizations and be leaders. So when um, the Leadership and Diversity Training Program started, we only could offer 15 slots. We're up to 20 now um, each year because of the funding that's been provided. And um, I imagine that after our, our um, capital campaign that's going on right now, um, will have even a higher number of slots. But that's the focus because it does more than just give somebody a scholarship and hope that they do well. There's actually a mentor assigned to them and they're part of a larger co cohort to make sure that they're doing well. Great. Um, how about in terms of uh, research in the area of um, exercise interventions and physical activity interventions in um, DEI um, populations? So ACSM doesn't do research. They have a staff and they run the organization. However, um, all of the groups that I showed you on the slide that listed all of the diversity initiatives, uh, many of those people are doing research around diversity, equity, inclusion in, in some groups. So it might be underrepresented minorities. Um, it might be people with disabilities, it might be individuals from rural communities or people who live in low income communities and have low resources, um, but everybody's doing research in that area. And um, one of the things that we, that I have done um, in this last round of, it was, that's not true, in 2019, so not the 2020 um, annual meeting programming, but in the 2019 annual meeting programming and moving forward, um, I added, so there, there are topical areas. And so the topical area might be fitness or it might be um, medicine or it could be something really specific like strength and conditioning or um, basic science. There are lots of topical areas. And I added diversity, equity, inclusion in a topical area. So when you submit your, if you're a, a researcher who does um, work in this area and you submit, um, you can check that box that it's diversity, equity, inclusion. And then there's a, there's a free typing space that says why. 
it's diversity, equity, inclusion. So we're not just people getting people randomly checking that box. Um, but that way we make sure that there's presentations and programming at annual meeting um, related to research around diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as clinical practice, because remember physicians come too and they are doing mostly cases. Great, thanks. We, we've got time for, for two more questions and they've, they've already been um, submitted. So um, the, the first one, you know, what is the take of, of ACSM on making cities uh, more walkable, especially for geriatric populations? So those of us doing work um, in Active Earth, which is one of our um, strategic initiatives, think that that's very important. But it's also really important. And so I mentioned Gretchen um, Patch has, uh, is, is an ACSM staff member who has um, a public health background. But it's really important to understand that it is the volunteers, so people like me and you, who are doing this work in the community. ACSM's role, um, there's, they're a staff of 50 people um, with 50,000 members and certified professionals who all want a lot. And so if you want something done, if you see that something isn't happening and you want ACSM to support it, let ACSM committee members know, join a committee, let the staff who's responsible for that area know, but also understand that it's the volunteers who are doing the work. It's not the ACSM staff. So when you say, what is ACSM doing? It's like asking, what am I doing? Or, you know, what is, um, the administrative council doing or what is the board of trustees doing or what are these committees doing because those are the people and i showed you the leadership structure those are the people doing the work uh, it is not necessarily a staff person does that make sense yep great okay thank you so much um and our last question um is how do you plan to publicize the importance of exercise and the programs aimed at improving dei especially for those who may not view this as a priority due to other circumstances? Well, we're doing our best. And so I did show you all of the education and communication that we're disseminating um, around this area. We keep publishing presentations, like we don't have a news channel, but it's all over the website. Um, if anybody visits the website, we push out this information to members through the Sports Medicine Bulletin and through blast messages when something is happening that would be interest be of interest to certain groups. Um, but really, it's up to us. And so if I work in a department, I don't, but if I did work in a department, an academic home, where my chair didn't value diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's where I start. Um, if I am part of a community organization um, that seems really exclusive and really not serving uh, those who need diversity, equity, inclusion, that's where I start. And so for, for um, I, I talked about the program where we send people um, to send our majors to schools. It's because I was noticing in clinical practice that they were doing referrals to dietitians, but no referral to a physical activity professional because there weren't any that were affordable. So it's really up to us if we wanna make change to make it. We can't look to a professional organization like ACSM and say, well, they need to change that. We need to change it and use ACSM as a vehicle. When I went to my first ACSM annual meeting in 1994, um, I told you there were only 10 people in the Minority Health and Research Special Interest Group. And that's where I found people of color. Um, walking around, I didn't see anyone. And that's just not the case anymore because I said this organization is my professional organization. It should represent me. I should see people who look like me in leadership and doing service activities. And I didn't back in 1994, so I changed it. And if you see something wrong, you can't wait for somebody else to do it. You have to think about what can I do to make the change and then change it. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your, um, your time and your expertise um, with us. Um, yeah, we really wish that we could have welcomed you here um, <laughs> on grounds. It's a lovely fall day outside, but um, thank you for, uh, for all your contributions and uh, to the ACSM and um, to uh, health equity um, at large. So, um, Well, I'm sorry I didn't get to go there in person. I've visited UVA once and it's a gorgeous campus. So I'm kind of sad that I didn't get to visit again. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thanks, Jay.
Jay, do you want me to leave and come back or just stay here? Uh, that's up to you. Okay. You, you can shut your stuff off if you want. Okay. All right, for the faculty that are there, let's uh, um, take a break until 3.10 and uh, then we can gather back and Nicole will join us um, for a discussion then.
How's everybody doing this afternoon? Good. Good. So, David and Marty, congratulations on getting appointed to that new committee that was uh, announced via email while we were <laughs> on that. So, uh, I can't speak for David, but I'm super excited. <laughs> thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the your words right out of my mouth, Marty. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so we, we've got um, some time now to um, to spend with uh, Nicole, and um, we just want to kind of open it up to see if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, following up on the the talk, and um, then we can kind of you know expand the um, discussion out from from there. Sue, go ahead. I had to try to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, Nicole, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it, we had a, a lot of students who were watching and, and streaming in, and I think that you really made a, a really positive impression. So I really appreciate the, the fact that you were able to come. I wish that you could come. And if you ever do want to come, we'll make sure that that happens. Um, so that was just background. But um, my question really is uh, like looking at professional responsibility and, you know, you talked about the mentorship and, and how that's important, but, you know, with, um, diverse populations, especially with faculty or the responsibility in other things is really at a conflict sometimes to somebody's research agenda. And I get the fact that you want to, um, you know, really promote the DEI and, and all of those things, which is really great, but you're also asked to be the person on every single committee, every single search committee, you know, so like you end up getting service to death and how do you, how can you talk to this group about, um, you know, parsing that out and, and choosing and, and really just what your, your take is on that kind of thing. Sure. So a couple we can of mentor people. A couple of things. Um, first with junior faculty, it's really the responsibility of the senior faculty and the chair to make sure that junior faculty are um, doing what they need to do to re be retained. And so um, as the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs, I am frequently having conversations with junior faculty members and people and chairs who are asking junior faculty members to do work that's unrelated to their retention. Um, once we get to be a little bit more mature, then I think it's okay. Um, once we have met what we decided that we were gonna do for our career, it's okay to bring in other people. But I, even the mid-career and more senior faculty, I always caution to mentor people who are doing what you do so if, it, if, if their work is unrelated to your work, um, find somebody who's doing work like them so that you can support each other. Um, and so those, those, those are, those, that's one way. The other recommendation that I give to the group is to think about who you're asking and why. And if you're asking the same person all the time, is it because they don't say no? Because they're afraid to say no, because they are afraid that if they say no, they'll seem like a disagreeable colleague who um, isn't invested into the department or into the school. And um, so they'll say yes, and that's why these people end up getting, who are frequently women and minorities, um, but also more junior faculty um, who aren't women and minorities, who are frequently getting the ask because they don't know how to say no to somebody who's more senior and could be controlling whether or not they're retained. So I ask us to look within ourselves and say, why are we asking this person to do that? Thank you. Go ahead, Art. Hey, Nicole, how are you? Good. Nice to see you. Um, so a couple of questions for you. One is sort of a simple one. You know, the ACSM does support research and they have competitions, you know, these sort of $5,000 packages for doctoral students, but it doesn't seem like they have any money set aside that's specific to DEI. Um, is there any talk about potentially doing that and maybe creating a pot of funding that might be a little bit more substantial than the current $5,000 that's available? Uh, there is not talk about it. Um, what I will say is that a frequently um, research related to diversity, equity, and inclusion comes through um, that research and review committee or research review committee is what it's called. Um, but they're treated just like every other proposal. And so right now there's nothing that sets aside research for any particular topical area. There's a pot of money for research and we get all kinds of 
proposals from basic science to clinical research to community-based research, research that's focused um, directly on exercise as medicine or on active earth or on diversity, equity, inclusion, they all go to the same place and they're reviewed for the best science. And so right now, um, is it like, not, is it impossible? No, it is not impossible, but it would be really difficult to justify funding one topical area separately than every other topical area. So I guess my follow-up to that would be, you know, based on the data that you shared with everybody and some of the data that we've sort of pulled out trying to increase diversity in some of our searches is that the pool is really small right now, right? It's a very small segment of ACSM and it's a very small segment of individuals who actually apply for sort of R1 research position. So based on the work that you've been doing, you know, with your group at ACSM, are there things that we can do to sort of make exercise science a little bit more attractive to, you know, diverse populations that are interested in science? And, and I guess one of my concerns would be that that group is so heavily recruited and there are other fields that may be perceived as being more prestigious, like medicine, for example, that, you know, what can we do to sort of attract them into sort of an ACSM sports medicine exercise science environment, as opposed to saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be pre-med because I know there are a lot of opportunities in medicine for me. Yeah, so we, we have to recruit early and that's part of what we've been doing. We recruit we're recruiting now in, in Indiana at a high school. We're going to high schools and getting students to consider exercise science because they don't understand what it is. Their parents don't understand what it is. But even for students, once they get in, there's so many challenges for underrepresented minority students. I alluded to in the earlier conversation um, in terms of having to work or having to play a sport in order to maintain their scholarship. Um, that really there have to be some wraparound support system available for those students so that they can be retained and that they can feel in it a connection to exercise science. Yes, I agree that other um, groups are re recruiting these individuals, but I also agree that frequently these individuals love to be active, love exercise, and maybe don't understand exactly what you can do with a degree in exercise science. And so it's really up to us to communicate this information to them so that they understand before they choose a major, but even if they're in a major that they don't particularly like and they're looking for something else to do, that exercise science is a way to go. We are losing a lot of those people um, to clinical and professional programs, but then we're also finding that a lot are coming back. And while, while they might be a physical therapist or a physician assistant, um, they're still really interested in what ACSM does and they're coming back and participating in the organization that way. But in terms of recruiting, recruiting faculty, I know it's hard to recruit underrepresented minority faculty to academic homes um, and especially in research one institutions. So we have to start training them early so that they feel really comfortable being here and doing the work and understanding what they need to do. I am hearing just far too frequently of um, students who complete their PhD, underrepresented minority students who complete their PhD and take a postdoc and the postdoc wasn't what they were told, or um, they were made promises that weren't kept. And so it's also really important to understand that um, that's gonna turn people off when you're getting them there to check a box. And once the box is checked, um, you're not supporting them to stay there. Can I ask a question, Jay? <clears throat> Nicole, this is uh, Marty Block. I'm a professor here in my area is disabilities within kinesiology. And first of all, I really appreciate you sharing some slides and talking about disability because so few of so few people in our field actually think about disability. So I really appreciate that. And I'm very interested in and I'm familiar with the autism specialist program through ACSM and the inclusive one. But are are there? I guess one question is: Do you need to to go through some basic AC, ACSM? training and certificate before you can take those disability specific courses? And are there gonna be future disability uh, ACSM courses that you know of? Yeah, so the answer to your first question is, I believe there's a minimum requirement um, that you have to have a, a, a NCCA certification 
um, from an entity. So it could be ACSM, personal training trainer for, um, certification, but it could be other uh, um, NCAA accredited certifications to sit for that credential or for those credentials. Um, to answer your question about whether there will be others, uh, how these how these um, cr credentials come to be is that some organization wants it. So for example, and then they pay for it because there's some costs associated with um, developing a credential. And so the example I have is a couple of years ago, um, the American Cancer Society decided that they wanted a, a cancer certification, a cancer trainer certification. And so they gave ACSM $20,000 to develop it. And that's usually what happens. Somebody says we need a certification in this particular area. And then um, they find funding to support the development and then it, it comes to be. So I hope so. And it's not unusual or uncommon. We know how important it is to support um, people with disabilities. And um, we understand the health disparity. We also understand that there just isn't enough research in that area. And so um, getting the support that this is gonna make a difference, that people with disabilities, you know, it's a no brainer to probably all of us, that people with disabilities, whether they're kids or older adults or somewhere in between, uh, need to exercise. And they don't because the opportunity to exercise is really limited. But unfortunately, we've got to build the evidence that if they exercise, they have longer, more productive, more meaningful, um, higher quality of life existences than if they don't exercise. Yeah, great point. Thank you. I have a question. Hi, Nicole. My name is Lucita Vela. Oh, I'm sorry, Sybil, I jumped in in front of you. I'm not following protocol. That's just me. I guess. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to get back to the, the, you know, the mentorship piece. We've talked about mentorship of faculty, and we've talked a little bit about mentorship of students into the profession. You know, we have a, a common read at, uh, within our school, and this year's common read is the privileged poor. And one of the uh, topics regarding the privileged poor, um, Anthony Jack makes the case for a hidden curriculum. And I'm wondering if perhaps, you know, us being able to be effective mentors, maybe we need to parse out perhaps a hidden curriculum that's very specific to the culture of kinesiology or respective fields, like I'm an athletic trainer, to really help to uh, bring students into our fields to understand perhaps where there might be some incongruence in um, students not feeling welcome or inclusive might be because of that hidden curriculum that exists within our respective professions. And I was wondering what you might, um, what you've thought about that, or if you found that particularly with the ACSM's mentorship program, if that was kind of demystifying some aspects of that was pretty important to getting people to feel like they're empowered to really be successful in their career. Tell me about the hidden curriculum. So the idea being that, you know, you know, a first generation learner comes into um, an academic setting and there's just so much they, they don't know they don't know. Right, um, and some very basic ideas of what people within academia know, or people whose, you know, students whose parents went to school is like they can navigate that environment so much easier because they there's these things that they just understand happen in certain ways, and and so wondering if if perhaps um, the way we train people or the way we expect people to be trained basically creates these hierarchies and infrastructures that are really hard to navigate, and we don't even recognize that we've created a really, you know, hard way of getting to a certain point. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes complete sense. Yeah, and so a lot of our work internally, I mentioned earlier about, earlier about the wraparound services. So we get students who are transfer students who do not understand um, what how transfer credit works, or they don't understand um, the order of courses that they need to take, or they don't understand that it's really important for you to participate in, um, these study groups um, or the importance of living on campus versus living at home and commuting to campus and getting involved in, in developing a support system for when you feel really stressed and having somebody that you can go talk to. So um, yes, th these are very important and this are what these wraparound services to talk about, you know, if you, if you get a, if a C or a D in a course, and you know that you want to go to professional school or you want to get into a PhD program, 
what you do about that, how you address that problem, and how you make sure in the first place that you don't get low grades. Um, students we see at IUPUI, students who you know, were over 4.0 students in their high school who are underrepresented minorities, and then they come to the university and faculty are really confused about why these students aren't advocating for themselves if they didn't have enough money to buy books until the third week of the semester and um, they're so far behind. Like, why didn't they tell me? And we frequently say, do remember, it's August. In April, they were asking for permission to go to the bathroom. And now you want them to ad advocate for themselves. So it's just really important to understand who these students are, where they're coming from, and to provide services and support, whether it be um, in a learning community, or it be um, some group in the, before the first semester to get people to understand you're in college now and it's not like high school. You're not gonna get a second chance to hand in seven late assignments. Your teacher, your professor does not care if you fail. I mean, they'll feel bad, but it's not gonna affect their job at all. Like in high school, if students don't fail, the high school or the if students don't pass, the high school loses funding. That doesn't happen in college. So student, but students don't know that that was happening in high school. They just think everybody is really loving and nurturing and you get second and third chances, which that's great if that's the way the high school operates, but really they are being motivated by the money. And um, that, that's just not our case. So in terms of like a hidden curriculum, that absolutely is one. Um, to answer your second question, yes, I think that we're still in the process of just demystifying um, what it takes to be a leader within ACSM. It's really clear if somebody tells you, but if you don't think to ask and no one thinks to tell you, you may never know. We just did a um, survey some of you might have received about fellowship within ACSM. And I'm amazed at how many people misunderstand what fellowship is. And uh, we have to do a better uh, communication because it really is excluding people from opportunities for leadership just because they don't understand what it is and how you get on a committee or um, how you are invited to run for office it's really clear if somebody tells you, but if nobody tells you, you'll never know. Hey, Nicole, it's uh, good to meet you in person. We've been emailing. She's graciously agreed to come to class next uh, Thursday. And I, and I send you the information you asked for. Thank you. So, um, you know, I was at Purdue for a long time, so I know uh, you really well. <laughs> And I think part of the, the challenges you probably have in, at your university is that there's just not that much diversity in the Indiana population. Um, I was just wondering what your take was on this, you know, because at UVA, we have a lot of minorities in the surrounding communities and still we don't seem to be able to attract them to the programs. Do you have any insight or any, anything you can share on how, like, how can we overcome that invisible barrier? So we have addressed it, first of all, financially, um, to make sure people can afford to come here or that there are scholarships available for people to come um, who are underrepresented minorities. Um, we, again, start in high school, recruiting them. We, we start bringing them to campus in high school. There are even programs with on campus that high school students can take a class on campus and get college credit. So we make them feel like they belong here before they have to make a decision of where they belong. Um, yes, there are very few underrepresented minorities in the state of Indiana. We focus on those, those counties like Marion County, which um, contains Indianapolis and Lake County, which contains Gary, Indiana. That's our recruiting focus. We go to those counties and especially Lake County is really poor. And um, these impoverished students who are very motivated to change their lifestyle. And we let them know it's possible when their parents frequently want them to go to work. We have to convince the parents, this is the right investment of their time and we're gonna make it work, work, work with your limited or lack of income. And um, we really are talking to the families very early and again, understanding when they make that transition, they're transitioning into a different world um, that, than what they've ever seen before to make sure there's somebody there to look after them and make sure that they're successful. Um, I, 
um, as Jay mentioned, I did my undergrad at Howard University, so in DC, so I know it's a little bit further away than you are, um, but I think it's a really similar population. And um, it's the same thing. It's the same that parents need to understand the value. And even if they're not paying for it, even if they have some kind of scholarship, it's still costing time, time away from um, income that they could be making if they were working rather in college than in college and helping parents understand that even working while they're in college um, isn't a great option unless they're working on campus uh, with an employer who's really flexible about exams and assignments. Um, so it's just, again, important to try to put yourself in their shoes and think about what the barriers are or might be. And if you can't figure it out, out ask the question, what is it gonna take to get you here? and then do what it takes. And also keeping in mind that not everybody is cut out for college. So make sure that you're going after the right group of people who are really motivated. And high school programs is a great way to go. If um, UVA has any high school programs that bring high school students onto a college campus to get that research experience, it's really important to do that early. We start sophomore year in high school, inviting students to come and join us for a six week summer research experience and then continue to communicate with them uh, throughout their junior year, summer, junior year. We bring them back if they wanna come and if they did well. We're doing a lot of pipeline programming to make sure that we're getting the underrepresented minority um, students that we desire to have at IUPUI. And our, um, I, was just, um, I, I was just looking at our numbers and they're increasing. Um, we've had the highest percentage of Latino students that we've ever had and um, our, um, African-American student population has increased over 4% um, over the period of two years. So we're really happy watching a 4% increase and then another 4% increase. So what we're doing is working. Um, it's really time consuming and it takes a tremendous amount of faculty who um, agree to say, I'll mentor this student if they're interested in the work that I'm doing, uh, but it's, it's working. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit. So, you know, one thing um, that I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, thinking about how we can design research studies um, in a way that will entice minority um, research participants to volunteer. Um, so I wonder if you had any insight on that, like if, there, if there's any um, experiences that you've had in Indianapolis or, um, you know, where we look for subjects or where we do interventions or, or anything like that that you'd like to, to share with us. Sure. So one of the things that's been going on for since I've been at IUPUI, but before me probably, is that we... Um, Fortunate, we're fortunate enough to have seven hospitals, seven different hospitals on our campus. And when you have seven different hospitals in an academic setting, there's a lot of research, a lot of clinical research going on. And we've established relationships with these hospital systems that they trust us to come in and work with their patients. And their patients trust us because we've been doing it for so long and they have good experiences and they know they're gonna get paid well and they might be made healthier um, by an intervention. So we have built a lot of trust among the providers, um, the hospital administrators, and most importantly, the patients that help us do research in that area. A good portion of my research, however, is community-based participatory research, um, which means that I'm looking for community members who are trying to solve a problem, hopefully related to physical activity and health, that I can help them with. Uh, but they get to decide what the problem is. It's not me. That's part of community-based participatory research. So somebody comes in and says, we're having a lot of problems with diabetes or um, we're having a lot of trouble with um, our kids um, um, having asthma because we think that we have poor air quality or um, increased injury or you name it, but it's their problem and they're coming to us to solve. And so how we understand what their problems are is I personally send research assistants to sit in on community meetings and listen and say, is there a problem that we can solve through physical activity? And because I've been sending research assistants to these meetings for so long, 
if one doesn't come, I hear about it. Like, where was she? <laughs> and so um, they're really used to having the students there and they want the students to listen to what's going on and try to solve problems. So that's one way. Um, a bigger challenge for me is that I am doing research with older adults who are members of minority groups. And so um, some of them were not US born. And so their um, experiences are really different. When I come and say, I wanna give you $50 to do this thing, they're like, what else do you want? Um, and so there's this level of trust that you have to go to the community